Hello and welcome. It is 1 p.m. here in Pacific Standard Time, and we're going to go ahead and start our science live session for today. Hello, everybody. My name is Amy Defoe. I'm one of the science teachers here at Graduation Alliance. Um, thanks for joining in today. I hope this is going to be an informative um, session for you. And um, we'll talk about a couple topics, as you can see here on the screen. We're going to be talking about some biology, but of course, we're also going to have some time to get any questions that you might have answered or any help that you need. So um, good, it should be a good session. So just a couple housekeeping items to start with, as we always always go through this. Um, these sessions are being recorded, is being recorded right now. We record this for lots of good reasons, of course. Um, if you're not able to view the session right now, you because it's recorded, you'll be able to uh, view it at another time. A link will be sent out to you. Um, and we've got this nice collection of uh, sessions that teachers in all different content areas have been creating for you guys to get some help get a little bit more information on your courses that you're taking so it's recorded so that you know for time purposes um also if there's something that we go through in the session that you maybe want to come back to as you're working through your course you'll have that ability to do so also um you know maybe you're not to this section that we're talking about today in unit two biology semester one um, so then later on when you do get that you'll have that option to go and and view this session and find it helpful for you. So again, it is being recorded. Um, how you can communicate, because we love feedback. I love having interaction during these live sessions. And there's lots of different ways that you can interact. You know, if you have questions, uh, respond to questions that I might have, I'll do a little questioning. But um, you can, of course, use your microphone. So on your computer, you can mute yourself. If maybe there's some background noise going on, just mute yourself so then it doesn't distract anybody else. And then you're welcome to clearly speak. Just unmute and um, you can just talk out loud and we'll be able to hear you. The other way is that also there is a chat function here in Zoom and so you can um, type in if you have a question or um, it's a great way to respond to quick and quick feedback right there. So chat message. Um, I will be checking that throughout the session, so you might see my eyes go up and down. Um, and also, you can use your audio as well. So that's great. So again, um, I'm one of the science teachers here at Graduation Alliance. So I may be your science teacher, or you may have one of the other two teachers that we have. And you know, we're all teaching the same science courses, so. It, it's all good if you have questions and you're like, oh, but you know my science teacher. It's all good. I'm here to help you, just like all of your teachers are here to do that. So um, please don't think that uh, that is, is going to be an issue, not at all. I'm here to help you in anything that has to do with science. So yesterday we or sorry not yesterday so last week we talked about um weather and the Coriolis effect uh and I just I opened up my blinds to I don't know if you can see so here I am I'm in Washington state and I actually live on the um in eastern Washington Washington is kind of split by the Cascade mountain range and so I'm on the eastern side of those mountains and right now you've maybe you've been paying attention or hearing what's going on um, lots of forest fires are, are happening and so actually we've been pretty much uh, stuck indoors for the last uh, few days because the the air quality outside has been so um, hazardous it's actually gone up into there's different um, kind of grades of how they rule the air quality and it start, starts off of course as like green is good and uh, ends with purple actually ends with black but um which is right before purple and we were in purple yesterday so we're all crossing our fingers that hopefully we get some um, air currents that come and move that that smoke out of the way because we're all going a little bit stir crazy uh, being inside so if you can see outside um, it's probably hard to see in my little window up there but we've got mountains in our backyards and uh, with how much how thick the smoke is right now you can't really see the mountains all all that much so <gasps> it happens forest fires we we prepare for this in the summertime but then when it happens and it's gone on a few days you're just like oh my gosh so okay so talking about weather so that's the current state here uh, with weather in Wenatchee hopefully tomorrow I can say the weather changes so Okay, let's go ahead and get started here. 
Um, so like I had talked about, we're going to talk about homeostasis and scientific investigations today. So this comes from biology semester one in unit two. Okay, so a quick little agenda to let you know what we're going to be talking about throughout this session. And these are about, you know, give and take average times. My plan, my hope is we'll spend uh, the first chunk here talking about homeostasis and the characteristics of life. And then we'll move into a question and answer, answer period where if you have questions about um, uh, an assignment, an activity, a concept, um, you'll have an opportunity to get that answer right here. And then we'll move into our next section, which we're going to talk about scientific investigations, um, which I think is really important to go over. And I think I'm going to continue this one uh, into next week. I think I'm going to go over today. I'm going to go over kind of the procedure of scientific investigations, why scientists use it, the scientific method, the steps for it. And then I think next week I will actually will do um, uh, an actual investigation. And then we'll end the session with question and answer again. Make sure that we get you off on your way so you can continue working on your courses. Great. Okay, so that's the agenda. If you have any questions throughout the session, go ahead and chime on in. But let's get started here. So we are in biology. And if we think about the word biology, Right, if we try and, you know, somebody says, what does biology mean? And we use those kind of decoding skills. We think of, you take that word and you split it in half, bio and ology. And you put those together, together then after you, after you get it. Bio means life. And ology is the study of. So in biology, we're studying, you know, it's the study of life. So it comes to this giant question then, what does it mean to be living? How do we determine if an organism is living? So you can see me right now. You can see I'm moving, I'm talking, I'm interacting. Um, you know, how, what would you say are the characteristics to say an organism is living or not? Sometimes it's really easy, like when we think about humans, and sometimes maybe it's not, not, not as clear and simple. So. Um, is a rock living? Some people might say, well, it's from the earth, so maybe it's living. Other people might say, no, it's a rock. It doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't need nutrients or it doesn't uh, need an energy supply. How about water? Do you think water is a, a living organism? Yeah, I think, well, what's water made up of? It's made up of molecules, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Um, we know that there's life in water, life, life lives in water, but, um, you know, we think of water isn't made up of cells. How about the soil that we have in the ground? Is that living or is that non-living? So again, some of these can be a little bit harder to, to determine. So today I want to talk about well, what are the characteristics then of living organisms? So there is a set of characteristics that all organisms have to have to be considered to be living. You guys have any ideas on what a living, what one of the characteristics might be? Hmm. Okay, let's go ahead and get to these. So, characteristics, characteristics of life. So scientists have come up with um, a set of these characteristics. And the first one is cells. So cellular organi organization. To be considered a living organism, you are either made of one cell or multiple cells. Um, so all living organisms are made from a cell or cells. And let's see, let's read through here. All organisms are made of small building blocks that we called cells. As we learned in unit one, cells are the basic unit of structure and function in an organism. So we talked about that whole, uh, we think about how an organism is made up. It's made up of cells. Cells, uh, similar cells come together to make tissues in humans. Um, those tissues then make organs, part of an organ system, which makes the whole organism. Okay. We know that some organisms are just composed of one um, cell, so they're unicellular. An example of that would be like, uh, you can see this is a one-celled organism. The whole entire body is made up of one single cell. Um, probably a common one people know of is like an amoeba. That would be an example of that. Um, so 
first characteristic to be considered living, the organism has to be made of a cell or many cells. So let's go back to water. What do you think? Is water made of cells? And the answer is no. Water is made from molecule, uh, molecules, but it is not made up of any cells. So right there, we would say water is not a living. <laughs> water is not considered living. Okay. Um, so we have cells. The next one is chemicals in life. The cells of living things are all made up of chemicals. And the most abundant chemical um, in cells is water. So we think about what an organism is made up of. Water is one of them. Carbohydrates are, in the cells, are the cell's main energy source. Two other chemicals we can think of, proteins, lipids, building blocks of cells. Nucleic acid, acids, which contain that genetic information for that cell. Um, and it carries out the instructions. So we're talking about that DNA. So we think about organisms must be made up of specific chemicals. And the most common ones, water, carbohydrates, protein, lipids, and nucleic acid. Okay, so there's the first two. Energy use. All organisms need to use some type of, or, uh, some type of an energy source. So organisms get energy from taking in and breaking down materials. Metabolism is the word that we use to describe the process of an organism taking in and using those materials. And cells use energy to carry out functions like growing and repairing injured cells. Now, when we think about energy, we can think about, welcome, we can think about um, our cells, maybe, let's see, it's a little after one here, so maybe you're, if you're in Pacific time, maybe you just had lunch. There you go. You, so we, um, organisms that are consumers, we eat other um, items, other organisms to get the energy that we need. We talked about this last week in the last live session when we talked about, um, two, sorry, two weeks ago, we talked about photosynthesis and we talked about cell respiration, how um, that's the transfer of that, that energy into a usable form. Other organisms like plants or producers, they're able to use the sun, as you can see here in this picture, um, they're able to use the sun um, along with some other materials to produce food on their own, okay? So all organisms to be considered living need to have some type of an energy use. Response to surroundings. Oh, take a look at this picture. Hopefully this hasn't happened to you. Oh man, so, um, we think about there's some type of a stimulus. So right here, the stimulus, which would, it um, elicits a response. So it's something in the environment that, that changes here. So this person, um, who knows why, but they were say accidentally, they touched their finger to a hot stove. Maybe they didn't know the stove was on. That's probably a good one. Didn't know the stove was on, touched the surface. That is that stimulus. And then our response to the surrounding is of course you reflex you know, very quickly and automatically you have a reflex to pull that hand back. So that's a response to your surroundings. So if you've ever seen another one, if you've ever seen a plant in a sunny window, you might notice how it grows or leans towards the light. Like a plant growing towards the light, all organisms react to changes in, the, in their environment. A change in an organism's surrounding that causes the change is called a stimulus. Some examples are light, sounds, other organism. An or organism reacts to a stimulus with what we call a response, an action, or a change in behavior. So we can see uh, this example, I guess this would be some type of like a centipede. Um, it, it gets a response, maybe it gets touched, and its response is its body curls up into a ball as like a defense mechanism. Okay, so another characteristic is responding to your surroundings. Um, I like this one in here because some people will talk about, um, you know, they'll be like, well, a plant, you know, is a plant living? And people will be like, well, it, um, it can't move. And when we talk about that response to a surroundings, plants actually do move. As it grows, it, it grows outwards towards the sun or its roots grow deep into the ground. Okay, a couple more here. Growth and development. All living things grow and develop. We all start out as tiny babies and grow into adults. Development is the process of change that occurs during an organism's life to produce a complex organism. 
in order to grow and develop organisms use energy to create new cells. So as you can see here, think about um, you know, the life cycle of an organism. You can look here at the example of a butterfly, how it changes and metamorphoses um, into, uh, it has different stages of its life, just like in humans. You know, we start off as babies, you know, we're toddlers and children and teens, adults and then elders. So all organisms grow and develop. They have a life cycle, okay? And another one here, reproduction. Another characteristic to be considered living is that all organisms have the ability to reproduce or produce offspring that are similar to the parents. Um, there's two types of reproduction. An asexual reproduction involves only one parent and it produces offspring that are identical to a parent. That is not how humans reproduce. Sexual reproduction involves two parents and it combines their genetic material to produce an offspring that differs from both parents but has many similarities. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about those characteristics? Okay, so here are a couple of different examples that I just throw in, kind of tie in together. So is it considered living? And again, we talked about that uh, amoeba. And yes, an amoeba is considered living. Um, it is, of course, made from one cell, so it's unicellular. It does need energy um, as a source. And let's see, it responds to its surroundings. So it's interesting how these kind of move. We can call these pseudopods, kind of like a false foot. And what happens is it kind of squishes together and then pushes off. And that's how that organism can um, respond and move. How about fire? It grows. <laughs> Is it made of cells? No. No, so a fire, kind of a little tricky one just because you can think about it well. You know, it needs some type of an energy source. It needs to have gases and it needs to have um, something to burn like wood. Um, it grows, it develops, it responds, but it is not made up of cells. Okay, so fire is not a living organism. A snowman, ha uh ha, -huh. just joking there. Yeah, a snowman, nope, not, not a living organism. Doesn't reproduce, <laughs> not made up of cells. Okay. And how about a tree? So we say, yes, a tree is a living organism. It's made up of cells. It's a producer. So it gets its energy. It's made up of chemicals, water, carbs, um, all that stuff. It grows, it develops, it has a life cycle from you know, a seed to a seedling or sapling to a giant tree. Okay. So those are the characteristics. So to be determined to be a living organism, you have to have those characteristics. Now, within uh, an organism, we have what we call homeostasis. And homeostasis is a state in which everything within the cell is in equilibrium and functioning properly. So in that word equilibrium, it's a big word, but if you look right here, you've got that prefix equa, meaning equal. So it means everything is like balanced out, okay? So right now, myself, I'm in homeostasis, I'm comfortable, my body is working, everything's functioning properly, okay? And we, that's how an organism wants to, to be. The state of homeostasis keeps the cell constant in what it needs to function. So kind of interesting to think about that, you know, in right now, in our, all of our bodies, everything is working. You know, we don't think about it, but all the millions of cells that make up our body are currently getting what they need to remain in homeostasis without us having to do anything except for maybe drink some water, eat some food. <laughs> so this is all being done, okay? This means that in homeostasis, the waste is being transported away from cells. It receives the nutrients it needs to continue to function. So this is constantly going on in all of the cells of an organism every day. Okay, to maintain that equal, balanced, properly functioning homeostasis. When something happens that, um, when an organism gets out of homeostasis, 
there is a response and there's symptoms and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Okay, so the structure primarily responsible for this in our cells is the cell membrane and the cell membrane is the organelle on the on the outside of the cell. So it's like the gatekeeper or almost like the skin. So it allows things to come in and it allows things to go out. So we want good things in like water and nutrients, waste products go out. Okay, so the cell membrane is what structure we say is most responsible for maintaining that homeostasis. And the way that materials move in and out of cells is through diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion, diffusion diffuse, um, think about that word, diffuse outward. It's the movement of molecules from a high concentration to an equal concentration, okay? So it spreads everything out from high to low, which means like in your cells, if your cell, is, if um, the cells are say lacking water, it's going to move that water that is in that organism's body to an equal gradient. So it's going to spread the water out throughout that organism automatically. It's going to diffuse outward. Um, I always think about like uh, maybe you have a diffuser or you've seen one of those diffusers at home um, or think about like spraying perfume or cologne. You know it, that fragrance molecules as it's sprayed out they're very concentrated and as it fills the air it spreads out to an even gradient. So it's not like we just if you spray perfume you don't just smell it right here, eventually it'll diffuse outward and mix in evenly to create that equilibrium, okay? So that's what's happening in the cells of our body. Um, osmos osmosis is, is the movement of water. So it's actually just the diffusion of specifically water in our bodies. And we all know that our bodies are made up of mostly water. Um, uh, so that's a big one there. Okay, so osmosis and diffusion, how materials move in and out of our cells to help us maintain that homeostasis. Okay, and so we think about, well, what are these types of materials? All living things, we need food, um, water, living space, and stable internal conditions, okay? So um, your cells could be removing waste products after maybe um, cellular respiration took place, and we have that carbon. We need to get that carbon to diffuse outward from our bodies. Same thing with the nutrients and water and gases like oxygen. It has to diffuse evenly throughout the whole entire organism to maintain proper function. Okay, so to maintain homeostasis, let me take a look at this little picture. We've got a bobcat and we have a, a, a snake. All organisms are either what we call a conformer or a regular, regulator. Regulator. There we go. I got it out. Thanks. <laughs> Conformers are organisms whose bodies change to the environment. Um, some people call those endotherms. So you think about us, okay? Or let's take a look at this bucket. We have a normal body temperature. So it's an internal temperature that um, our body is constantly working to keep, okay? So our bodies can only function at a certain degree. 98.6 around for humans. And so our bodies are actually working to maintain that. It needs energy to do that as well, okay? Um, other organisms that we would call um, um, a conformer, their bodies are gonna change. We can think of these as what we would say an ectotherm, like a snake or a reptile. Their body temperatures actually change due to their surroundings. So, you know, maybe when it is nighttime and cold, their um, their bodies, that body temperature decreases to what it is outside. Um, as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter throughout the day, their body temperature rises. And that, to them, is homeostasis. And they're not using, what's interesting is they're not using energy to keep their body at that constant temperature. So you can kind of think about um, their energy needs might be a little bit less than say um, us or other um, endotherms that are having this constant body temperature. We have to use energy to make our bodies remain at a proper level of proper, proper temperature to work. Okay. Oh, can you think of ways that humans respond? Um, oh, I wanted to go back to, um, Oh, did it not say in here? 
Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Okay, so we talk about um, those energy levels being needed, and we call that passive transport. Um, passive means that there's no energy required. So when we talk about diffusion and osmosis moving materials throughout ourselves, it doesn't require energy to do so. So we call this passive transport. And when we think about, you know, endotherms and ectotherms, we, um, endotherms are using energy to keep that body temperature, whereas uh, at, an ectotherm, there is no energy being used and they're fluctuating with that outside temperature. What about humans? How do we respond? How do we respond to maintain homeostasis? Any ideas? You can take a look at this picture and you can kind of get some, some, some ideas that we can think of. You know, a stimulus again is something in our surroundings that is going to cause a change. And then of course that response is how our bodies do that. So you can tell um, it's summertime, it's hot. Now we know that our bodies wanna remain at that constant temperature. So when our bodies get too hot to maintain homeostasis, we sweat. We sweat to produce um, like a liquid that then cools our skin and our body down. Other side of that, you know, when we're cold, our body shivers to heat itself up. Okay, in activity 2.3.1, it goes over um, the homeostasis and the characteristics of life here. So I just wanna go over those quick little questions here. The first one, it says your body, your body systems work together to maintain internal conditions or what have we been talking about? So to maintain internal conditions, to be working, um, it's we're functioning properly, creating that equilibrium. Again, that is homeostasis. In endo, so think inside, in endotherms, their body temperatures change with the environment. Is that true or false? endotherms, so inside. And the opposite of endotherm is an ectotherm, which means outside. So endotherms, their body temperature, in endotherms, their body temperature changes with the environment. That is false. Endotherms remain, um, maintain that constant body temperature from within. So that's why we think of endo, meaning inside from within their bodies, that temperature is remaining constant by using energy to keep that properly functioning. Oh, oh, number three, an example of how temperature can affect homeostasis. Higher temperatures can cause you to shiver. Lower temperatures can cause you to sweat. Is that true or false? They're flip-flopped. So that is false. Higher temperatures cause you to sweat. Lower temperatures will cause you to shiver to, of course, maintain that homeostasis of that proper body temperature. Osmosis is the diffusion of water through a cell membrane. And that is correct. So osmosis is the movement of water diffusing throughout a cell to create that equal balance. Passive transport requires no energy. Passive transport requires no energy. So this is the processes of osmosis and diffusion in cells, and that is true. No energy is required for those processes to work. Which part, or sorry, number six, which of these is not a characteristic of a living organism? So again, which one is not? Requires energy, is made of cells, reproduces sexually. It does, all organisms require energy. All organisms are made up of cells. Um, but this last one reproduces sexually. That one is not a characteristic because it needs to be just reproduces because we know that uh, different organisms with, will reproduce differently. So there's asexual reproduction and there's sexual reproduction. Okay. The last one here. Oh, sorry. Um, growth. 
So the main part of the cell that maintains homeostasis is the, so we talk about where, what's that main structure in um, an organism's body that maintains, responsible for maintaining that homeostasis? Cytoplasm, the head, the nucleus, the cell membrane. I think they kind of trick you out here with the head because you think, well, the brain's there. We're thinking about all organisms as well. And they said here, the part, the main part of a cell, and that's the cell membrane. Remember, it's the outside protective layer that allows materials to come in and out. Okay, does anybody have any questions about characteristics of life, homeostasis? And then this would also be a great opportunity if you have questions about other topics, questions about activities that you um, might need a little extra help on. I have a quick question and get that answered here for you. Um, during these live sessions, it was a great opportunity for you. You know, if you're kind of stuck, you're thinking throughout the week, you're stuck on an assignment or you get to one on that day, you can bring it to a live session. And during the question period, your teacher will always have a question, a, a, a time for you to be able to ask questions. Um, you can get that, those questions, get that help that you need right there, right on the spot. And of course, if you're not able to make the sessions using um, chat, using email, whatever your preferred method of contact is, shoot your teacher a message. They would be happy to help you. Um, get you to help succeed in these assignments and get you moved on through your course. Sometimes it just you just need somebody else to explain it. Sometimes you'll read something like maybe in the directions and you get a little bit stuck and you're just like, mm. you know, reach out to a teacher say, hey, can you like reword this for me? I know that happens to me sometimes. I'll like read something. I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I'm just like, can you verbally tell me? And just that a different method sometimes makes it click a little bit better. Okay, so we'll move along and we'll have another opportunity if you have questions at the end of the session. Okay, so I wanted to talk about scientific investigations, which is huge in science, um, but sometimes in the setting that we're in right now here in Graduation Alliance, it makes it a little bit difficult. So we do have a section in biology that talks about uh, scientific investigations and um, throughout the course, you'll see that there's a couple videos in there where um, I do a couple quick little investigations to help you see, um, I think, what did I do? There was one that had to do with um, water cycle and the movement of currents, um, looking at how light affects temperature and that. Um, but in a setting, we don't have the opportunity, in our setting, we don't have the opportunity to actually do, you know, as many labs as we would want to, but it's still an important, important piece. And we do get it in there. So I want to go over that. So scientists use investigations or experiments to answer questions or solve a problem. Um, sometimes it comes from an observation. We see something and it just makes us think, well, why is that? How does it affect it? Okay. Um, we use experiments. Big thing is to answer a question. When we think about, you know, answering a question, we have to have what we call evidence to say if something is right or is correct or not correct. And we use investigations to ensure consistency to make sure that we are answering the question that we want and there aren't any other kind of outlying um, factors that could uh, make our results not as accurate. Okay, so we call that the scientific method. And let's take a look. Um, the first step to the scientific method is a question. And when we think about what is it that we're trying to answer or solve? And this should be written by a question showing the relationship between two different variables. I always like to say, how does blank affect blank? And I always use that. That's kind of like my, um, my little template or my equation I use. And then I just plug in whatever I'm looking at. How does light affect plant growth? Oh, that was the example right there. The one that always comes to my mind. <laughs> how does the amount of light affect plant growth? So here we have our two blanks. Amount of light affect plant growth. Um, I was looking at another one that I was thinking about, um, I was gonna do 
was um, how does uh, different types of liquid affect the melting rate of ice? So again, two different variables. How does one affect the other? Okay. And when we think about a question, it has to be um, it has to be testable. So you can't just say, "Well, why is why is the sky blue?" Because <laughs> how are you going to test that question? So it has to be able. To, it has to be a question that's going to be able to give you results or data. Okay. And that data could be in the form of well, lots of times it's you know numbers, growth, time the quantitative and other times it's observations that we see okay after we have our question we want to think about it and then what we do is we develop what we call a hypothesis and a hypothesis is an educated guess as to what will happen and it also includes your, your reasoning why okay the um, hypothesis basically answers the question that you're testing just by what you're thinking. So it's, it's making us think about our background knowledge. What do we already know about this topic? Have I seen this happen before? Um, and then we kind of come up with what we'd say is an educated guess. Okay, so an example that goes for this one, how does the amount of light affect plant growth? I wrote, and I use the formula, if then because. So I think about if there is more light going off here, then the plant will grow faster because plants need light for photosynthesis. Okay, so I said, if there is more light, then the plant will grow faster because plants need light for photosynthesis. Okay, so we talk about when we make our hypothesis, we take our question and we say, if I do this, then this is going to happen because now again it's an educated guess it could totally be wrong and for the most part scientists are usually wrong in their hypothesis but it gets them thinking about what possibly could happen okay so we have our question we have our hypothesis and then we have what we call our variables and in experiments we have different types of variables um, there are three types of variables in experiment in an experiment we have the manipulated the responding and the controlled variable. Sometimes you might see this as uh, independent, dependent variables as well. So manipulate. So think about it. If you manipulate something, you change it. So the manipulated variable is the variable that you're changing to see its effects. So if we're testing how um, light affects plant growth, the light would be the manipulated variable because we're going to change the amount of light the responding variable is what happens because of that change. Plant growth. Okay, so you manipulate one, you change one variable to see its effects on the other. The controlled variable is what stays the same. We have to make sure that there is something that we can compare our results to. Okay, so in the example that we have, um, it kind of gives us this baseline so that we can look at, okay, we'll, what, we'll look at our changed variables and then compare it to the one that is what we'd say is natural or unchanged. So we think about with the experiment with the plant, how does light affect plant growth? We would manipulate the amount of light. So we might put, we might give um, a, a plant, you know, 12 hours, I'm sorry, we, maybe we'll give the plant 20 hours with a lamp. Maybe we'll take one plant and put it in a closet where there's no light. And then we would have one that would be our controlled variable where we would do nothing to it. We would just, you know, leave it in its natural state. Maybe if it's inside, you could think maybe, you know, in a windowsill or um, it's just a plant that you have outside. So the contro controlled variable is what we keep the same. It's also considered like the middle ground. So if you're using different amount of liquids, you would have a high, you would have a low. The controlled variable would be that medium so that you can compare it. Okay, so after we have our variables, we have our question, we have our hypothesis. Then we get to the point where we start kind of writing out the experiment. We start with a material list. And this is everything that you would need for your experiment. Why do we need a materials list? Well, you wanna make sure that you, know, you could reproduce this, like you could do it again, or somebody else could as well. You also wanna make sure that you have all the materials that you need before you get started. 
think about if you're making a cake. Got to make sure you have eggs before you start, or oil before you start mixing it together, because then you'd be out. Okay. Procedure is our step-by-step -step detailed list of how the experiment would be performed. And we say it's detailed and it's step-by-step. -step. Your goal in writing a procedure is that you want somebody else to be able to write this or be able to, to um, complete the experiment as you thought. So exactly how you want it. So we do that with details. So when we talk about, you know, amounts, we give detailed amounts. We would say five milliliters or a time, you know, five minutes. So we would give detailed, clear um, uh, procedures and how it would take place. Data, you would wanna create some type of a data table where you can collect your data. Again, what it is that you're measuring or what you're observing. The reason why we do this beforehand is because we wanna make sure, sorry, that we have it all set up, ready to go so that as we are going through the experiment, we just have to plug in our data right there. So we're not spending any time um, creating this. And the table, of course, as we lay out and make sure that we have all the parts that we need, that we're actually looking at our variables. Okay, so I use the example of amount of light in plant growth. So with a data table, we always have some type of a title. And then we have subtitles. So uh, we're looking at amount of light in plant growth. How does the amount of light affect plant growth? And then my subtitles here. This is the manipulated variable, the different types of light. So I have no light, natural light, a plant light, 20 hours. So again, here's a nice little detail piece. I put in there how, how much, okay? And then we would say, this is where we would collect our data. And I'm gonna do this as over a period of time because I'm looking at plant growth. So I wanna make sure I'm gonna give it five weeks for that plant to be able to grow, okay? In other experiments, it might be trial. Um, you could be doing trial one, trial two, maybe you're um, looking at the, the rate of um, balls dropping from, you know, the stairs or something like that. You're looking at how, how does the mass of a ball affect dropping rate? And so maybe you would have trials instead of weeks. Okay. And then it's always nice to have what we have like as our average total growth so that we could see at the end how each one compared. Okay, so after we have that, um, then we would actually perform the experiment. Collect our data, look at that data, and then we get to our conclusion. And in your conclusion, this is where you answer your question. But now that you've completed the investigation, you have data. So you have evidence or proof that's gonna support your, um, your idea or it, it, support either your hypothesis or it's going to prove your hypothesis was wrong. So the data serves as that evidence to help prove and support your ideas or disprove it, which is always great because again, if we're wrong, we can look at our data and still see, okay, well, this is what did happen. And then maybe from there, we would get another idea to maybe retry this in a different way. Okay, so I just did a little example here. Um, when I write a conclusion, couple of main parts is I go back to my hypothesis and I say my hypothesis was correct because the light, the amount of light does affect plant growth. And then we use, we always put in there from our data because this is our evidence. It's like, we want to show it. I know this from data. I can see that the plant grew differently. The plant with no light did not grow. The plant with natural light grew six centimeters. The plant with a lamp grew 10 centimeters. This shows that plants that receive more light grow faster and taller because 10 centimeters is more than six centimeters. Again, this is hypothetical. I made this up just to show you an example, but here I um, explained my hypothesis was correct. And then I gave my kind of my range of my data. So my different manipulated variables, the plant with no light, plant with natural light and the plant with a, with a lamp. And then I have what would be like your concluding sentence, concluding statements or answer. And this is where you're actually showing well, this is what happened and this is why. Okay, think about some experiments you could design around homeostasis. How does the light affect plant growth? How does exercise affect heart rate? Say, how does temperature affect heart rate? So when we think about the scientific method, um, science is everywhere and every day we're questioning. So we could design so many different experiments 
um, to answer the questions that we have or observations that we make. Does anybody have any questions about scientific method? I know I just kind of went through the steps of it and I think next week I'll carry it in and use that and we'll do an investigation. So if anybody has any ideas on an investigation that we could do, probably not plant growth because we don't want to wait five weeks. <laughs> That's the other thing is you have to plan your experiments, um, your investigations, because if you wanted to do, you know, something that involved plants, you'd need that time to let it grow, to be able to see your results. Great. Okay, so just going into activity 2.4.1, which talks about investigations, just wanted to go over these quickly. The responding variable is what you are blank based on the changes of the manipulated variable. The responding variable, is it proving, comparing, measuring, predicting? The responding is what you are measuring based on the changes. Okay, so like with the plants, it would be the growth, which is what we are measuring. The manipulated variable is what you change. The responding variable is what, it, what becomes of that change so it's what you are measuring. In the following lab problem, what is the manipulated variable? How does light affect plant growth? And the answer is light. We're changing the light. So again, manipulate, we're manipulating the amount of light to see plant growth. So light is the manipulated variable here. The controlled variable in an investigations, in an, investi in an investigation that, that the controlled variable is, sorry, I messed this all up. The controlled variable in an investigation I can say is important. <laughs> the controlled variable in an investigation is not needed, is what is measured, stays the same to provide a comparison, or it can be changed. Think of controlled. So controlled variable is what we are comparing. It's our baseline. Okay, so we use that to then look at what we did change to see its effects. So you think about plant growth, okay? So we have one plant that's just natural, okay? We didn't change the amount of light, nothing else. We can then look at our manipulated variable, the one with no light and the one with lots of light and to see, well, how does that affect it? Maybe, you know, this is maybe how people, um, farmers or scientists learn to make things better because they can see what happens when we change something. So we use that controlled variable as that comparison. The last one here, the manipulated variable is what you are measuring in an investigation. Again, look at the word manipulate. Manipulate means to change. So that is false. We are not measuring the manipulated variable. The manipulated variable is what we are changing. So that is false. Number of the steps to carry out an investigation. So when we think about the scientific investigation, the first thing that we want to do is we state the problem or our question. Number two, we make a hypothesis. What do we think is going to happen and why? An educated guess. We gather our materials, make sure we have everything. We carry out the procedure. And as we carry out that procedure, we collect data, which then allows us to conclude, write the conclusion that answers our problem and our question that we are trying to solve. Again, we carry out these steps. We have a very specific way of carrying out an investigation to ensure consistency, to make sure it's accurate. Okay. So anybody have any questions about scientific investigations? Hmm. 
You're also welcome to ask any other questions that you might have about um, science. It could be an earth science, biology, it could be a different science course, marine science, environmental science. Again, just because I'm talking about a specific topic, never feel like that then you cannot answer or you can't ask a question that you um, are having issues on. Okay, again, during these live sessions, it's the chance for one to also get some information, uh, learn a little bit more, but also to get questions answered. And if you're drawing a blank, anytime, you know, again, as I always keep saying this and repeating it, you know, if you have questions as you're working through your activities and your assignments, please reach out to your teachers. You know, they would love to help. Um, if you're stuck on something and you're getting frustrated, please reach out, send them a quick chat. They would be happy. I would be happy to um, ease that frustration, get your question answered, and get you moving along. Okay, same thing with live sessions. If you have a topic that you would like to see done, think about next week in science, if there is um, part of a unit or a lesson or a concept that you would like more information, I would be happy to complete, um, set that up for next week. So if you've got ideas for topics, shoot me a text, chat, email, and I can get that in there. Okay, I hope this was informative and I hope you got your questions answered about homeostasis and scientific investigation. And I hope to see you guys again next week. Again, keep your questions going, keep that open line of communication. We're here to help you guys succeed. Have a great week. We'll see you later.